In some ways, Alaska is nothing less than it promises. In the summer, the constant sun lights up a landscape so beautiful it seems a crime to look away. From a distance, the tundra looks like a muted patchwork. Only when you bend towards the ground to check if the berries have ripened or if the mushrooms have come up after rain can you see the spongy cosmos it contains. In the rivers, salmon move powerful, wave-like, together. And in the times between night and day, when even the salmon seem to still, you are taken by the raw force of a landscape stripped of its summer nostalgia. My name is Amira. I am half Qatari, half American, and my mom's side of the family is native Alaskan. I'm an online journalist for Al Jazeera. My mom's village has one of the last subsistent salmon cultures in the world, but their way of life could disappear. For now, it persists, and I feel really grateful to be a part of it. If people ask, I usually say I'm from Qatar or the Middle East. My dad says that when he was growing up, the lifestyle in Qatar was very simple, and sometimes I wish I could have seen what that world looked like. The pace of life was slow, everybody knew everybody, and there was just one place to get your vegetables and fish down at the coastline. But oil and gas completely transformed the country. And even in my lifetime, the city has dramatically changed. There's this glittering skyline that developed almost overnight, and we have all this wealth now. People are usually shocked when I tell them that my mom is from Alaska and my dad is from Qatar. And they always, always ask how they met. But the story is pretty boring, really. They just met in university. And at the time, they still had to see if they could make things work. <laughs> this is not fun. Oh, coming to Doha for the first time. I was excited to come and see the country because, um, you know, it was just someplace new and different. You always can tell if someone is really willing to adapt to a situation where you think this is going to be home for you or not. And I think your mom was the type that wants to learn and hear about different cultures and religions. Here I'm taking their only daughter away from Alaska all the way to the <laughs> other part of the world. They've never been here mm -hmm. and just lived on promises. To... You were taking a woman thousands of miles away. What did you promise the parents? Oh, the parents to bring her back every year. Yeah. Yes, I did. <laughs> I did. Do you remember taking dad back to Liamna for the first time? I think I was probably pretty nervous about what he would think it was a great experience, even landing at the airport, you know, looking at gravel runway. You can see this huge, like, cross-shaped runway. Mm. And then you're looking all around the country to be like, what, what's here? Where, where's everything? Because, I mean, he was, like, from an urban situation and stuff, and I just thought, oh, man, he's probably going to think that he's coming to absolutely nowhere. Yeah. You know, but... Um, yeah. It all worked out in the end. He adapted to village life easily. <laughs> <laughs> if to survive, you have to do it yourself. You have to go catch your own food. You have to build your own shelter. And I think that, that part was really amazing for me. And then what parts of each culture, Arab culture and Alaskan culture, did you want your kids to know? Every culture has really good, positive things. And of course, as parents, we want the best out of both. We just wanted you to be able to experience everything, things that you didn't have a chance to experience here. I mean, formal education, obviously, you girls went to school here, and then through the family you learned all the traditions, you know, of Eid and Ramadan and all the, you know, all the family celebrations. Whereas, yes, in Alaska, you have got like 21 hours of daylight. You were free to roam around and do things that you wanted to do. I feel more American here and then more Arab in the U.S.
Yeah, I think that's just the nature of being half of one thing, half of the other, is you sort of feel outside of things. Since I was born, we've tried to fly back each year to help my grandma with the salmon run. I just remember being so excited to go to Alaska every summer. As an adult, I forget how much I miss it until I'm there. The only way to get to the village is on a nine-seater plane flying 45 minutes out from Anchorage, which is the nearest city. <laughs> we even Good. got salmon cooking. The community that my grandmother lives in is actually two villages. One is called Iliamna and one is called New Halen. New Halen is at the mouth of the river that feeds into Lake Iliamna. Iliamna Lake is part of this broader water system that produces 46% of the world's sockeye salmon. Salmon return to the place that they're hatched. So they're hatched, they go out into the ocean and stay there for a few years and then fight their way back to lay their own eggs. We probably should come to the back door. Can we just walk through? Oh, yes. Just because I want to see. My grandma ran a bed of breakfast here for at least 20 years. Things are pretty much the same as you remember it. You remember when your kids planted all those trees? <laughs> they got so big, we couldn't see the lake hardly. I used to be so scared of this. I'd like run because <laughs> I was so yeah. scared. Isn't this a room where we found the dentures? In this room? <laughs> yes. Oh goodness. Amira, here down here. The memories here are so wonderful. It's gonna be nice to stay in here again. This place was so formative for me, even though I only came here during the summers, this is where I sort of envision a lot of my childhood. You get to explore, you get to make mistakes, you get independence. I come back here in the summer, right? This is a summer home for me. But when this is a home home for people, there's just such a fundamental attachment to the land. For many, including my family, fishing and hunting is vital to survival here. I think it's hard for people to envision places that do do this out of necessity. So it's not just a cultural thing or a traditional thing. People need to do this. Because flying out groceries or supplies is so expensive. People need salmon and other wild foods to have enough protein for the year. Oh, there are people out. Someone's smokehouse is going. Can I help with anything? Heading and gutting? Yeah, yeah I guess. <laughs> Do you have I one? don't want you to get all fishy with your... I have another. As a kid, I really loved the heart of the salmon. When the heart comes out, it's often still beating. So I would take the heart and run around to nearby fishermen and show them. The persistence of the salmon is incredible. The current is going against them. Bears are trying to get them. Fishermen, props, nets. And then you find a catch one, put it on the fish table, it's wriggling. You kill it, and its heart is still beating. So how has processing fish changed versus when you were growing up or before? We didn't have freezers up until in the late 70s. And where would you store the fish before freezers? And put them in like a cache or? Yeah, we put them in the cache. I got this knife from my grandpa's. I've only ever used the vashla. Yeah. The ulu. Or Here's ulu. Vashla. The same thing. I know, but. <laughs> but you're, oh, where's, you where's the other one? <laughs> Is that your gut bucket? There's just sort of this companionship around the fish table. Men aren't typically around because they commercial fish or work other seasonal jobs in the summer. It's mainly women, which, yeah, I really love. 
you're talking, you're gossiping, joking, making fun of each other. I got super dark. Yeah, I've never done it with a straight knife. And it's just really fun. You feel really supported. Hello! How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, you too! I think we say doing fish because there's so many things that you do to the fish. I'll follow you. As a kid, I would help empty the gut bucket and hang fish up to dry and can salmon. But now I work at the fish table. And even when the weather is bad and your hands are freezing and your back is tired, there's nothing more satisfying than doing fish. <laughs> it's been really cool going to all the different fish tables. And everyone's quite particular and maybe a little snooty about the way they do fish because I think everyone thinks they do their fish the right way. When you have the canner full of water and these heavy jars, yeah. they jiggle and they move and then they start, they don't seal because they're crooked. The little bit of salt or even uh, fish slime, if you leave it on here, it won't, it won't seal. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Remember you uh, used to do this? Yeah. So I remember your mom always taking cans home. We travel with cans back home. Yeah. Just because it's easier. They're I less can't fragile, imagine but... where you come from. <laughs> what do you I mean? mean? I mean, uh, it's just a different life for me. Four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. Okay. Time to can. Just the knowledge you need to have takes a lifetime to acquire. So when you're talking to an elder, it's just like opening up an encyclopedia. <laughs> But the cold makes it good so it don't get sour. What are these for? These are just the hard smoke. Hard smoke. I use birch to smoke. We cut it kind of early in the spring and let it so it don't be so strong. I might have these rocks on there so it don't get too much air. How do you start it so that it's smoking and not a fire? I uh, still haven't learned this art. Grandma's teaching me how to fillet. Mm. Which was rough at first. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I started to get it. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a while. You just feel like such a city slicker there sometimes. I would die in like a very short amount of time if someone asked me to live off the land. Uh oh. This is blowflies. See the eggs? Do you want me to get a knife to take eggs out? Yeah. Do I just smash them? Yeah. Yeah, and then smash them. I think just a couple more hours there. I was at someone's fish table the other day and they kept the fins on because they said that the weight of it kept the fish open. I was, yeah, I was The Eskimos and the Indians do things differently. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, us Indians think we know better, but <laughs> it's just the way things are. These two villages are sort of at the interface of two different tribes. One is Yupik people and the other is Denaina people. My family's Denaina. <laughs> what percentage of New Haven is native? I've got to say at least 90. <laughs> at yes. least? Maybe 99. <laughs> yeah, at least, because there's just, you know, maybe Ten people here that might not be. And what is the population of New Haven? Uh, we're about 180. And right now, we're just kind of having some problems with jobs. But um, we have a lot of our um, people here in New Haven working, and they're working at Pebble right now. Pebble Mine is this proposed copper, gold, and molybdenum mine that would, if approved, be located less than 20 miles away from Iliamna. It's really valuable. It could generate between 300 and 500 billion US dollars over its lifetime and provide jobs for the community. But it could also pose serious threats to the ecosystem. If its pollutants got into the surrounding area, they could possibly ruin the salmon run 
in a way of life that has been around for millennia. The tribe, we have a contract with Pebble. They're doing the studies here this summer. It's providing jobs for our people. It's short term. It, it, it might end next week. It might end in August. So it's just like everybody wants to work because this is the only place to make the money right now. When they're not here, it's pretty bleak. Do you want them to be around long term? Right now, the tribe is neutral. Fish is important to our culture. Fish is important for us to, you know, provide for our family, but we still have to work. What other way are we going to survive? We, I, you know, we can't pick up our families and move to Anchorage or wherever the jobs are, and we don't want to. Oh, people. Sports fishermen. So you've been coming up for 15 years? Yeah, about 15 years. Why do you keep coming up? It's Look beautiful. It. Look around. <laughs> yeah. It's so many places to go and, and different style of fish in every place. Oh, he's got him. Oh, that's too funny. <laughs> that is too funny. I wish we had a camera. There's your answer right there. Only in Alaska. It's so funny how fishing can be so important to so many people, but the way that it's important is so radically different. There might be people who come up here every single summer for 25 years, not really know a local name, but still have the place be such a huge part of their life. Hi, Mira. Hi, how are you guys? Thanks for agreeing to talk to me. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> How long have you been in the sports fishing and hunting industry mm -hmm. in Niliamna? I started in the mid 80s and I've been doing that pretty much uh, ever since. For years, Iliamna was the best kept secret. There was only a handful of lodges in the area. Well, the word finally got out. It <laughs> couldn't be kept secret. Lodges have gotten so exclusive with the flying uh, very personalized, high-end foods and everything. A fishing trip at a premier lodge in this area today that's $9,000 for a week might have been, you know, three or $4,000 in the mid-80s. They want the, the big money people, and they get it. What's the relationship between lodges and the local community? You know, I think historically there's a lot of animosity between locals and that are struggling to make ends meet. And then these high-end rich lodge owners that come in for four months, make a bunch of money, and leave. <laughs> but it's gotten a lot better over the years. They try to, to hire more locals and involve the community more, and I've seen it. What is the argument that a lodge owner will give for not hiring locals because it seems like that would be cheaper than flying an entire staff in to staff the lodge every season. I don't know if I'm if that's No, absolutely. Or not. It makes nothing but sense. I mean they could they can go catch fish for themselves and hunt and everything, but it's a whole different thing being a guide for paying guests. The local natives, they're raised to survive, not to be a sport fishing guide. Somebody that you've brought in, you know what they're doing every minute of the day. They're not out drinking or getting in trouble. The local person that works here might crash his Honda and break his ankle and can't come to work tomorrow. Somebody staying at the lodge isn't going to do that. Substance abuse is quite foreign to me, having grown up in Qatar, where drinking is not part of the culture. But it is a familiar story having gone back to Alaska year after year, and it's definitely affected my family here. I think it's one of those things that can be quite baffling if you don't look at the bigger picture. When there's no job to look forward to is, you know, the alcohol. We haven't really heard so much about the drugs, but we've heard them, you know, they're here. Everybody that's, I know that's working, they have a reason to get up. They, you know, it's making them feel better. They're doing something. 
and not just staying home or watching TV or, you know, not doing anything. That's also the scary thing is having no law enforcement yes. here. Yes. What do you do if you need a trooper? I mean, well, we have, to, we call. We have an 800 number and he does respond. He comes in from Masala. So, so how many hours away is that? That's like the next flight, the next morning. But we've um, had to respond to a um, couple homes and we don't go by ourselves. I work for the Social Service Department. Um, it's called the Indian Child Welfare Act, and um, that's um, helping our tribal enrolled members that are um, having trouble with substance abuse. Since we don't have a v trooper or a VPSO, they call us for everything that happens. Like if somebody's drinking and driving, they call us. If somebody's fighting, they call us. I mean, it doesn't happen that often, but when it does, you know, we're, they call us first. Mm. And majority of the time, it's just uh, my sister and I that run off to the houses. What is it like working on this issue, which in, can be sensitive in sort of a small community? It's very hard. I'm related to everybody here. It's like, one of the worst jobs to have in the village because they blame you first because you're the first one to respond. Mm. It doesn't necessarily need to be in numbers, but how widespread is the issue in terms of substance abuse in this community? For alcohol abuse, it, it's pretty high. Like when I was younger, I. Every time I came back, I was like, oh, you know, time to have a shot, time to have a shot. Um, I've been sober for about six years now, and it's a whole different world for me. Mm -hmm. Just that people are sent out of their communities for treatment, mm -hmm. like that must also be difficult, right? Like I said, this is a very small community. It kind of makes them feel ashamed of themselves that they had to leave the community. So we're going to INN, which is the Uyamna New Haven and Dalton Electric Co-op. It was started by a few of the residents here and now powers three villages around the lake. It also provides some of the only steady jobs in the area. During the winter in Alaska, it can be so cold that not having heating can be really dangerous. Having some form of electricity is really important. My dad's so sad he couldn't make it up. Yeah, it's been quite a few years since he's been up here. Yeah, that's the thing. It's just work keeps getting in the way. That darn work, I tell you what, making a living, <laughs> yeah. it really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Until you get the paycheck. A lot of people look at a hydroelectric plant and think, oh, that's super cool. You're getting free electricity going over the falls. How nice. They don't see how hard of work it is sometimes to keep it going. Yep. Uh, they don't see the two o'clock in the morning when the turbine shuts down, or if one goes down, they both go down, and to keep from burning diesel fuel, we saddle up and head up there and figure it out. How much diesel does this plant save every year? About? If we were on full diesel power, we'd be burning about a quarter of a million gallons a year. So from 250,000 to 3,000 or 4,000 gallons? Yeah. In a mm -hmm. year? Yeah. Amazing. How many people does the electric co-op employ? Uh, one, two, three, four. Four, four, four total. Us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Small okay. but mighty. <laughs> so this is the intake. All the water comes through here. How big is the tube? I want to say it's like four feet. People came up here, biologists, uh, to make sure that it wasn't harming any of the wildlife, the fish, of course. I think there should be a lot more of these in the world because we have a lot of water. And um, instead of using whatever nuclear power and diesel and coal and all that stuff, which is 
you know, very polluting, as you know. Um, it, it would be nice to use stuff like this. Uh, I'm pretty proud. I like my job. I like that it's hydro, it's uh, earth friendly. Most natives, we take care of the earth, but we take care of where we're from. We take care of the fish and the water. Being able to do that and help my people, I'm very proud to be able to work here. There's a lot of people here that were born and raised here uh, and don't want to leave, you know? I've lived in Hawaii, I lived in the States, um, I've lived in Anchorage. Well, why would you want to live anywhere else? There are parts about Native culture that I don't really know about yet, but I also don't think that's an uncommon thing. <laughs> and I'm trying to learn more every summer. And here's my sewing room. This is my happy place in the wintertime. My mom did a lot of hand sewing. This is what she used to do. Is this, uh, what is this? Calfskin. This is the part that would be the hardest because she used to use her thumbnail and her teeth. How do you harden the leather like this for the sole? You don't tan them so much that they get soft. Really pretty. Who wears cuspucks? Most women around here. I feel like it's not just like a Yupik thing or a Danaina thing or... It's, yeah, I think all of the people, pretty much everyone in Alaska wears them now. So I've always wanted a cuspuck, I just didn't know if I was allowed. <laughs> oh, you... Everyone that wants a cuspuck. Even half Arabs? <laughs> Your mom's from here, you can wear it too. And if you have a sweater, like a loose sweater, you can bring it to me and I can make one. Really? Yeah. Cool. I'm going to pick out some fabric. Okay. Where did you grow up? I was actually born and raised across the river. My mom used to save salted eggs for fishing through the ice in the winter. One night, the dog started barking. We had, my dad had a dog team. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning. I was so scared, my teeth started chattering. My mom says, there's a bear down the beach. I was eating my mom's um, salted eggs. My dad got his rifle and he killed that bear. And then when I was 12, we moved over here. The cuffs will be kind of loose. You don't mind that? Yes. You have little wrists. <laughs> Let's see if I have enough for the pink there. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Fina. Okay, there we go. Hey, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. And I should have this done before you leave. Okay. If I'm not doing anything else. My grandma grew up with her native language until she was about six, but then she lost it. And there aren't many native speakers left here. The village is now fighting to get back its language and dance, but there's still a lot of pain, I think, when it comes to what was lost. When you hear someone speaking a language that's dying, it just feels so beautiful because it's so rare. His church name is Ilian. His uh, native name is uh, Ayatala. And you still speak Yupik, yeah? 
Huh? You still speak Yupik? Yes. Who do you speak it with? Uh, my grandkids. See, I born with it and I never forget my language. Mm. And when I went to school, I didn't know one English word. I always been using native words. And then what happened? Well, <laughs> they, every time I use my native, my native language, the teacher would say, stand me right by her, just to speak my own language. They told us not to speak our language, it's only English. Here we didn't even know English, how we could use them. <laughs> I get tired of standing beside the teacher or in a corner. One day I was just thinking, I'm not going to try to ever use my native language again. And I never did. I even I quit standing by the teacher anymore. <laughs> and some kids take it um, hit by a yardstick just to use our uh, native languages. You're laughing, but that seems. Huh? You're laughing, but it seems quite sad. <laughs> mm -hmm. I never see. Uh, you walk on native dance. I didn't see that when I was growing up. Father Shurgi, he said it was uh, devil's work or something. I don't know. No good for our church, Russian Orthodox. Before they stopped it, when would they do it? Oh, uh, when they gather, um, you know, like like carnivals, you know, just like that. If you want to watch tape, huh? <laughs> you want to watch tape? Last carnival they had here with dog teams. Do you want to see it? Do you want to look at it? Uh, the new people came over. We used to have lots of people for carnivals. Come here. Are you in there? Huh? Are you in there? Yeah, I'm in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. All those people are not here anymore, though. You should see now there's hardly no people when they have dance. I've watched a lot of young people stay or come back, even if it is difficult, because this is their home. And there's just a different priority here. Hello? Is it Kelsey? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> There's a smile. So how's the past year been since I last saw you? Mm, Catch me up. <laughs> Not much has happened. <laughs> Except that she grew and I got my job. When did she start walking? Ten months. I'm trying to remember if we played together when we were young. I, yeah, I think I remember <laughs> like one once summer. Once upon a time. Yeah. <laughs> did you work at the school this year at all? Last no. year. Year before. Uh. Then I resigned. Why? 
because I was pregnant and it was too stressful. And I just couldn't no more. Yeah. Are there any jobs at Pebble, like full time? I think, I don't know. I mean, my job's permanent, but it's just only four hours a day. Right. If you don't find a full time job here, do you think you'd ever move? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really like the city. Yeah. Why not? Too many people. It always smells weird. <laughs> Fair. Well, ever since I got pregnant with her and had her, I was na I'm like limited to what I can do. But her dad like goes out and hunts and provides for whole family gets wood. So how would you feel if this place was gone? Probably sad because it's where I grew up. And like, I don't know, it's just home. <laughs> Where's the Honda? By the ball. Kids here are encouraged to go away to college, but their families also hope that they come back home. And if you go to college, there's a chance that your classroom will be larger than your entire village that you grew up in, which can be really difficult and overwhelming. So Sissy's working at Pebble now? Yeah, she's a helicopter coordinator. So after you graduate? Oh, yeah, okay. Where do you think you'll be? <laughs> after I graduate, um, I plan to go to college and, well, right now I want to study wildlife biology. If you wanted to try something new, why didn't you go to a boarding school like Edgecombe or in a city? I don't really like being in a city. I kind of like the low-key village. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you like being in a city? I don't know. It's just too busy for me and I've always like lived in the quiet. You can't really do this in the city. You know, I do have a sense of belonging in terms of people, but I'm sort of envious of people who feel like they undeniably, without question, belong to a place. Someone told me that you moved away last year. Yeah, we went to Alakanak. How was it? I didn't like it. Is it a big village? Yeah. How many? About 700 people. What did you miss most from here? The water. The water is clear. It's really pretty here. Are you working right now? No. don't think there's any jobs around, only for Pebble. And I'm against Pebble. So everybody got a job, but they don't think of the lawn. It's hard because some of my family members work up there. I don't want to go against them. I've seen that mine up in that Red Dog mine. And I've seen what it did. And I'm just scared to death of it. I wish I would just leave.
I'd rather have no job than kill all the fish. I'm going to Pebble Mine tomorrow. I'm nervous. I just want to make sure I ask the community's questions directly to the mine. I just hope we all have a clear understanding of what might be in store for us, good or bad. <laughs> I think we're going to go over on uh, this, this side, side, right? Yeah. Okay. Hello, Sam. What's our route going to be today? Uh, today we'll head up uh, over to the uh, deposit. I'll land on the lookout. It will shut down. Pretty much every every stretch of ground in Alaska is uh, pretty beautiful. And our challenge as a state, in fact, one of the arguments to Alaska becoming a state in 1959 was how would such a vast state, 365 million acres, um, be able to support itself economically. And so the challenge for Alaskans is how do we continue to have an economy um, and then maintain this balance with the, with the environment around us. I was out here one time and uh, saw a wolverine and he kind of was trucking along on the top of the other hill and said, oh, you're out here, huh? Well, it's just kind of my area. I'm going to keep on going through. Welcome to Pebble. Can you talk about what's under our feet? Under our feet, yep. Under our feet, there's a world-class discovery of copper, gold, molybdenum, silver, rhenium, and palladium. Many other states, they have access to rail or power or roads. We got none of that here. How you get the product from where you acquire it to a place where you can transport it to market is a big deal. Talking about a portage road. Yeah, so one um, bridge crossing over Upper Talara that then extends down to the north shore of Iliamna Lake where we'll have a ferry terminal where we'll be able to load the concentrated minerals onto uh, ice breaking ferry, transport across the lake. So it'd be a long Tularic. Uh, we'll have one crossing there, but yeah, it will go kind of around to, uh, Upper Tularic. Because Tularic is a spawning area, yeah, for salmon? Um, it just happens to have more potential uh, sockeye productivity than the other two drainages. Also for us is how do we get sufficient energy brought in so that we can run our facilities. And in our case, we're looking at about 180 mile natural gas pipeline that will then um, provide the power for a power plant here to generate electricity to support all of our our infrastructure out here. It's a great challenge to ask people to um, look around them and, and identify the minerals that they use. So I like to use the prop of the iPhone. 52 different minerals in an iPhone have to come from somewhere. The frustrating part about the tour is like, we're all at fault. You know, there's a root problem. And the mine is in it. The mine is a symptom of some root problem with the way we approach the land, the way that we consume things. Mike talks a lot about Pebble being an economic necessity. I also think fish are an economic necessity. Living off the land is a necessity here. We have fundamental issues with our relationship to the planet. There have been lots of instances that I've seen where indigenous communities just have a better model. Just because it might be a smaller number of people, it doesn't make it a less valid way of life. I do really care about this place and my family is from here, but at the end of the day, I am also another person that comes here during the summer and leaves. So I feel like I take a lot, but not really sure what I get back. 
See there, the eggs are kind of loose. So when we start cooking them, we just pull this stuff off. I make my grandma happy when I come back. I help her with fish, so that makes me feel like I belong in that way. That's beautiful. Oh my goodness. I feel like I'm gonna cry. It's so pretty, Fiona. <laughs> wow. Oh, look at that. I know I'm biased, but this is the prettiest cuss book I've ever seen. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's yours. <laughs> Can I try it on? <laughs> I love it. I'm glad you like it. Thank you. How much do I owe you? You can, uh, we can trade fabric. If you, you said you had fabric over there? There's this place called the Souk, which is like a traditional market, and they have a bunch of um, different fabrics there and stuff, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you can pick out fabric and send them to me. We have a fun project to do back in Doha. I feel like if you give yourself permission to care about a place, you also need to give yourself permission to belong to a place, and I have a hard time doing that. But I also know what it's like to be repeatedly drawn to somewhere, to love a community and a people, and to want to honor their way of life. And maybe I can draw others into this place too. Yeah. 